presented this morning is uh, Chris Allison. Chris, these are some of our friends in the woodworking. It's a motley group of people. You kind of sold Chris a little bit of force <laughs> along the way because you said, oh, it's only a couple people <laughs> the next time. It, well, they might be filming it. Uh, and there may be a few more people than that. I heard, you, I heard you kind of worked him over during a period of time. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I am a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> By the time it was done, I heard Kelly was mugged. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank Wayne for giving me the opportunity to share my, my passion. What I want to do this morning is we have uh, two of the different styles of canoes uh, or boats. We're going to start with the uh, cedar strip, which uh, you see here with the western red cedar. So uh, we'll, we'll get started. Let me get going on the... Uh, the presentation here. Uh, power. One of the things that, that the, I got started on is it just be like if you walk in the store or you uh, you were invited to this this group. I get the distinct wood turner feel about this uh, this this group. But I was in a, in a bookstore and it's since gone defunct. I have media play or something. I was in the hobby section looking around, and I came upon this book. It's called Canoe Craft in the hobby section. Now, I thought, hey, this looks pretty interesting. I had, as my part of my college degree was required to take four PE type courses, and one of them was canoeing and sailing, which don't tell my folks, but that was the best class I ever took. So I already had an interest in that. And I saw this book, and basically what it is, is it's a step-by-step -step guide on how to build a cedar strip canoe. And I thought, you know what, I can do that. I can do that. And let me give you a little bit of my background. Uh, I didn't have any woodworking experience before I built this boat. I grew up on a farm in North Texas. I learned from my father just general construction, electrical, plumbing, that type of thing. But I had no woodworking experience. But I could read and I thought, well, I'll just take it slow and see what happens. So one of the things we're going to start with, the, the first picture I'm going to show you up here is, is an older style canoe with the ribs on it. One of the advantages of the cedar strip with modern technology is you don't have to use the ribs because this boat has an epoxy, uh, it has a fiberglass cloth on the inside and outside with epoxy. And when you get up close, you can see the weave, but uh, it's, that's what gives it its strength. You know, cedar is a very soft material. Now, the next thing I thought is okay, where am I going to find clear cedar boards? 17 feet long with no knots in them. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, so you can find them. Some uh, suppliers can, will do that. But I had somebody tell me, they said, go down to Norcross Supply. And it is since burned to the ground, which, oh, man, what a tear in my eye. But I went in and asked the guy, I said, hey, I'm going to, he said, what are you doing? I said, okay, I'm going to build a cedar canoe. And he said, come with me. Took me down to their warehouse where it was full of cedar boards up to 20 feet plus, no knots. So I was golden. I had my cedar, I was ready to go. Uh, before we get too far into this, I want to give you a little overview of, of what the woods that I used in, in the general construction. The trim is walnut, uh, the yoke is oak, and I happened to be in Home Depot one day and they had a wood that I didn't recognize and it was aspen. I don't know, you know, I saw it every once in a while and I thought, oh, that was an interesting looking wood and I did a little research and saw that it was uh, fairly strong for its weight so I made the seat frames out of aspen and then uh, the, uh, I used birch to countersink the uh, plugs. So there's a variety of, of woods involved on the canoe itself and wanted to give it some contrast. Um, so let's start here. What specifically did you buy from the strips? Western red cedar. Dressed three quarter. Uh, I, I cut it. It was. It wasn't dressed. It was. I was buying them. They were uh, one by sixes. I think one by fours. They had different. You're off. Yes. You ran them through the planer. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. When I built this boat, I didn't run it through the planers. My father-in-law did. Yeah. When I built this boat, my woodworking tools consisted of a drill, a skill saw a jigsaw, and a random orbital sander. That was it. So, you know, it, it, most of you probably have a very well-equipped shop, but I didn't. My father-in-law uh, helped me with some of the, uh, the cutting, and, and we used his, uh, his uh, routers and things. The strips are cut 
to the thickness is uh, it's a three quarters by a quarter and there's a bead and cove on them. So as you make this transition, they nest well in there. Now the start of this is the strong back. Basically it's a wood box, the length of the canoe. This is the foundation for everything. It's important to get this as straight as possible because uh, everything's going to be done on this. So what you're doing is on this construction, you're starting with a series of frames every 12 inches. The canoe's built upside down over the uh, frames and the first one you see is for the stem. So if I started on the end and there's, I'm going to explain in a minute why, the, why I have the holes in it and it's not to lighten the material because that's just the framework uh, that we use to, uh, for the construction. Alright, so this is the first challenge. Any of you who've worked with walnut knows that it doesn't generally bend like this, okay? Uh, and so I, I didn't have, I thought, okay, how am I going to do this? So what I did is I cut the piece into uh, quarter inch strips uh, thickness wise and I put hot water in the bathtub and threw them in there, much to my wife's chagrin. And I let them soak and I changed the water out a couple times. I let them soak overnight. Put a plastic bag on that stem piece and started clamping them on the end and then I hit them with hot water and I started pouring hot water over them and slowly bending those till I got them to make this curve which this is the finished piece right here is what you're seeing. So once I was done with that I left it in that uh, state for about 24 hours to let them dry and they came back a little bit they were pretty much in the position that I needed them. Since then I've constructed a steam box out of PVC and, uh, and a radiator hose and it works much better as those of you who've ever steamed wood I can get a piece of, uh, of walnut or, or maple or something to do what I want it to do in about 30 minutes versus you know overnight and fighting that thing. Okay. So this is the process when you buy the blueprints for the canoe it the only thing you get is the, the plans for the station molds they were full size so it's easy I just cut them out you know traced them every 12 inches and that determines the shape of the canoe, uh, the width. And one of the things that, that if you've ever done uh, boat work and we talked to, uh, you have a very uh, prolific boat builder in your, your midst, uh, boat building is a, it's a compromise, okay? You can have slow and steady, you can have fast and not as stable so what I wanted to do is I wanted a canoe that would be uh, stable enough to take around. This canoe is the, is the model is the Peterborough and it's designed on a, uh, it's called a day tripper. It's good to, I generally take it to Stone Mountain, you know, I paddle around and, and I was with, on the lake a, a year or two ago and I told my wife, I said, let's paddle over by the campground. And she said, why, are the people there who haven't seen your canoe? I said, exactly. I said, keep paddling, woman. So you, basically, this is the start. And this is the, the critical construction phase is to make sure that those frames are true, level, square. That's just plywood. Just that, yeah, that's just particle board. Because it's, it, yeah, it's even worse than that. It's particle board. There's nothing structural about it. All this does is to provide just the shape and something to, to, put the, uh, to put the pieces against. So there it is. You get a little different perspective. Uh, so it's ready to go. And I think I worked on this for a couple of weeks, you know, putting a string line and, and making sure. Because that, if, if that's got a twist in it, so does this. So that, that, that part is critical. There's a couple ways of doing this. Now, and it's not, it's not very clear in the, in the picture, but one of the things that I did is you take, I just use masking tape, over the edge of the frames. So as I glue the strips together, I don't glue them to the frames as well. That's bad. You don't want that. So what I did is uh, there's a couple of options you have. Some builders staple the strips to the frame. Okay? 
And I thought, you know what? I don't want to end up with having rows of staple holes in the in the strips. It's not a structural issue because the strips are encased in fiberglass and epoxy on the inside and out. It's more of a uh, of a visual, uh, you know, final presentation type thing. So I thought, okay, this is going to be a lengthy process. So what I would do is I come home and I would do one or two strips an evening. I use just regular. I think I use tight bond wood glue because again, it's not going to see any moisture. There was not a requirement for waterproof glue. And in that picture, you can get a little bit of a sense of what the holes were for as part of the, the clamping process. So I had two requirements. I had to have the strip against the frames, and then as I moved on, I had to have the strips butted together. So those were the two, against the frames and together. And I used a variety of homemade you know, clamps, masking tape, because there's not a lot of uh, you don't need a lot of, of, of strength pushing the strips together, just enough to get you a nice bond and, you know, control the uh, squeeze out as much as possible. So the bottom of the, each strip has the, uh, yeah, and then the, the next one nestles in on top. That's how you can make this transition on the curve. So the, the beginning strips, which this was under here was strip number one, uh, they were not an issue, but as you start making this transition, then that allowed it to, to go. And, and you can, during the process, it wasn't, you know, I had to ferret and smooth it out. So it took me a couple of weeks to do that. I come home. Yes, sir. Uh, your first, your, your planking uh, from the shear down, right? Uh -huh. And your first strips are running horizontal or following the shear? You know what? They're running horizontal. Uh, because if, uh, on the end, I had some that every, you can see, yeah. you know, I had them. I had to come back and cut the line at the end. Is that is that what you're asking? If, if you looked at the Stelmont book, mm -hmm. was he running them along the shear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I made the decision, and, and that's what what it, the the options are are to run the strips at an angle and follow the curve, or to run them, you know, horizontal and then cut the edge, and I made that decision. I, I might do it different now that I've got a little more. You end up with a herringbone at the keel. Yeah, yeah, and that was one of the challenges that I had is, is you know, what, what's gonna happen uh, with the pieces at the very end in the middle. So, it was a very simple process. There's nothing on this construction that's complicated. It's just the same step over and over and over again with the strips and it's pretty simple joinery and, and, and woodworking. All right, so once you get the strips, let's go to the next one. Yep. All right, oh, no, that's fine, that, we'll do that. Okay, so you can see I'm making progress. And then it gets a little more uh, interesting as you start to come down towards the bottom. But uh, it's just, again, the same process over and over again and uh, until you've got the boat completely done. When you get to the very middle of the boat, You've got a couple of options, uh, whether you want to draw a straight line or you do a herringbone pattern. Uh, I'd probably do it again. I'd probably do a straight line. I kind of have done a little of both in mind, but uh, it, it ended up working out okay. So when you finish that, this is the part of the process that was not as much fun. Sanding and fairing the hole with cedar, sanding cedar all the time, that's a great time. I had my dust mask on, you know, get me a little smelter once in a while. Uh, I, sanding cedar made the whole house sound, smell good, I'm sure the moss went away, whatever. But that's just the first step. You've got, you fared the outside, and I just use a random orbital sander. The inside, I'm ready to go. The next step is where it starts to get a little more hairy, is cedar's a soft wood, how are we going to give this canoe strength? We didn't use the ribs like the standard old school construction. So let's go back one for just a second. So what I did, six ounce fiberglass cloth. Started on the outside. The outside was actually relatively uh, easy. Wanted to do that to gain some confidence and skill with the uh, fiberglass. Uh, I laid it out on the, uh, on the bias, work until I got it. Because you can work fiberglass cloth to get it to where it lays down pretty smooth, where you're not gonna have it bunched up at the end and joints and that type of thing. Uh, so what I did was 
I bought a Tyvek disposable suit. For those of you who have not worked on fiberglass, what you get fiberglass on stays on, okay? Forever. Yeah, there's no, you, you wear your old clothes, and if it gets on the floor, it's forever too, okay? So I found that the, uh, I went to West Marine or somewhere and they had a disposable Tyvek, you know, same stuff as the house rat, jumpsuit, and I put that on. So it's got three coats of uh, West System epoxy, and they have a specific formula designed to dry clear for wooden boats. The first coat uh, basically adheres the, uh, the fiberglass to the boat. You wait, I think I waited, uh, it was about six hours, came back, put on a second coat. Is that your? So uh, it must dry really slow. Mm -hmm. it, it, it does dry slow and it depends on everything else, uh, temperature, humidity, uh, there are some, what, the, the way that most epoxy comes in a resin and a hardener, and there are hardener formulas that will dry faster. You know, if you go to Home Depot or, or you know, even in, in here, I'm sure they have five minute epoxy. Yeah. They have slow, and then they have, you know, so it's the same thing. What you want, yes, sir? Well, what, what you want is you want some working time with your epoxy. That's the goal. Yes, sir? When you drape the cloth over, you have folds. Do you work those folds or do you cut those out? Like no, what I was able to do is there's a weave in the cloth, okay? It, I was able to maneuver the cloth to where I could actually, it has some give to it, to where I didn't have any folds, except for the very end where you, you know, you trim. But I was able to do it because it has a gentle curve to where there were no folds. If you just keep working it and stretching it and you don't, uh, you take your time. That's why, yes sir? Trouble with your with your coat blushing. Now, and the the blushing is is more of a, a problem uh, that I think that the uh, the manufacturers have solved. Uh, blushing, it, it what it turns it cloudy, right? Yeah. yeah. And you know, I don't know if it's because of the I, the epoxy uh, I used was was uh, a, a higher quality or what, but even today there, you still have to kind of pay attention to that. But one of the ways you can get around the problem of your epoxy blushing is you don't, you keep going. You don't come back. What I did is I put the first coat on, you know, Friday evening at, you know, 11. And I came back the next morning at five or six and did the next coat. And then I came back that afternoon. So I put three coats on consecutively. You need to have time for the epoxy to set up. And I used a squeegee uh, to get it. And the other thing you want to do is you don't want to, you, thin coats are better. Uh, and if you can even have a way to keep your epoxy warm, that, that helps in the coverage. But you want to do three thin coats. The first one adheres, and the second two are basically burying the weave to where you can't feel the weave in the epoxy. It's, you did yes, the whole boat, not keel out in halves? I did the whole thing. Yeah, I did the whole thing. I just, I took the plunge. And you know, when you get to this stage, it's exciting, you know, and you can see on this picture on the kind of the bottom left where I still have to trim the boat to the shape of the, uh, the gunnels. But this is, a, this is an exciting point. You're starting to get a sense of what it might look like. You know, you've done this work and it looked okay when it was just sand and cedar, but it's like when you take your, your turn wood or your other projects, you put that stain on there or that finish and you think, okay, now we're talking. Same thing, but at this point, what I have is I have a boat that's covered in lumpy plastic, okay? And there's a lot of sanding that's involved. And I can tell you that as, as much of a joy as it was to sand that cedar and that nice cedar, it's a pain in the rear, let's do the next one, to sand fiberglass. It's, the, it's dusty, it's, it's not a pleasant experience, and it's also depressing. Now here is the boat after I've also done the inside, and I did the inside in one piece as well. And the inside was much more challenging because on the outside, obviously, you start at the top and then just come down and watch for drifts and stuff. The inside was a challenge because you're, you're, you're working into that enclosed space and you have to come up on the sides. And it was a little more of a challenge. But sand fiberglass is not an attractive thing. But you, it's part of the process. And one of the things that you need to make sure you don't do is sand through the epoxy into the weave. 
So it's kind of a nice balance and you just, you know, basically what you want to do is get it smooth. You don't, less is more, as long as you can get it smooth. And some of that can be avoided when you put the epoxy, the uh, fiberglass cloth on and the, uh, the epoxy. So you sand the uh, fiberglass, oh, let's do the next. If, yes, sir. If you do sand through in, into the weave, is there a repair mm. you can affect on that? Yeah, at this point, it'd be the best time to do it. Generally, what I've seen they will do is they'll sand an area out, go ahead and, and, and get an area, and then put another piece of uh, cloth down and start the process. That's the time to do it. If you're going to sand through the, the weave of the fiberglass, you need to fix it at this point. So 10 or 15 coats of Epiphanes Dutch Spar Varnish at $32 a quart and with uh, 600 grit wet sandpaper between each coat uh, gets you to this process. This is a picture of the uh, canoe at Stone Mountain. Uh, I like the picture, two classics. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a very straightforward uh, design. There's not a lot of, of uh, things to, to, uh, to trip you up. One of the things I did want to do, and I, I don't know how we're going to do this with the camera, is I came the seats. Now that was an interesting process. Um, the seats, if you use natural cane on this, when it gets wet, natural cane will get stretchy. There was, I could only find one supplier. This is a plastic cane from China. And this canoe is 15 years old, okay? It's got a lot of use, I use it. I mean, if you come up and look at it, there's some scratches and dings in some places. Uh, the, the seat is as tight as it was the day I caned it. And, you know, caning the, the canoe seat, Google. You know, there's books you can buy on how to cane. It was not a difficult process. It turned out a lot nicer than I thought. I was actually kind of impressed myself a little. I thought, okay. And again, for a guy who didn't have any woodworking experience and very few tools, this boat was a confidence builder for me. Uh, this allowed me to think, okay, I can do that. I can do something. I was, had the opportunity this past week, I was traveling in Connecticut, uh, seeing customers. And interestingly enough, and I don't know how this happened, my schedule opened up enough for me to see Mystic Seaport. And I was able to spend a couple hours there looking at their very large wooden ships. I thought, I could do this. <laughs> now, you're going to have to rebuild your steam box. Huh? Yeah, I am. Right. Yes, sir. When you finish the bottom of the um, boat, are you using strips as well, or is that a wider, um, wider um, piece? Of no, the whole, the, everything is strips. Yeah, and and you have a decision you can make on whether you're at the when you get to the bottom. Because the way the boat's designed, do you want to do a herringbone type pattern or do you want to go down the middle? And again, I kind of did a little of both. That's, you know, one of the areas where if I had to do it all over again, you know, I probably would have done it the same or different. But everything other than the trim was those 17-foot strips. Yes, sir. If you weighed that, how much does it weigh? How much did I tell my wife it weighs or how much? Because she helps me carry it. I told her it weighs about 50 pounds. The, I think it weighs about 75 or pounds or so. It's hard to tell. I, I can carry. What I do is I move it around using the yoke, and it's not that difficult. But it's like a sail. If the wind's blowing, you better have your hands ready. But once I get it up on my shoulders, it's it's very easy to move around. It's just because it's so long. Would a wind boat be lighter? I'm sorry. Would a wind oh. boat be lighter? I don't. It might be because of the lack of the fiberglass and the epoxy. It probably would be. Uh, it would probably be lighter, yeah. That, but it wouldn't be. It wouldn't have the strength. You know, one of the things that, that I, I can tell you, it was an extremely satisfying. You know, Wayne told me about some of the skills that, that this group possesses, and and I've been told stories about. Uh, and I don't know if he's here today. There, there's someone here who's the measuring guru, who who you know. There's people who do these amazing things. To be able to, to put my family in this and launch it was, was a pretty neat deal. I mean, most of us don't have the opportunity to do woodworking and throw it in the lake and then and see if it's going to float or not. And, I, I, you know, it's funny because, I, 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 well, I certainly don't want to. Uh, I was, it was eminently satisfying that it didn't leak. 
you know, and I, I knew it wasn't going to, but but I had to get past that. I want to tell you well, a, a little bit of a, a story. Several years ago on the 4th of July, my house was hit by lightning and caught on fire. And while the uh, my next door neighbor, man, our neighbor, who was a fireman, he was home, thankfully, he was fighting the raging fire. I got my, my kids, my <laughs> wife, uh, our computer, and my canoe out. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what order they came out of the house. We're not going to discuss that. We won't discuss that. This sits on a padded rack outside of the sun. Really, the only thing that, that's going to, uh, other than general wear and tear, uh, the uh, UV sun rays will break down the epoxy is why you want a good, you know, why I have 10 or 15 coats on it. Uh, I keep it on a padded rack in the garage out of the sunlight. Uh, and uh, about every three or four years, I'll take it to the shop, sand it down, put a couple coats of varnish on it. Other than that, I mean, we've used it every year for 15 years, so it's held up very well. What are the, yes, sir? Back to your finishing, uh, you sanded the, after three coats, of epoxy and yes. then sand. Did you put another coat of epoxy on the uh, sanded surface or went straight to varnish? There? No, after I had three coats of epoxy and sanded that smooth, I went straight to the varnish. There's not a lot of maintenance involved. Now let's talk about the advantages of this type of construction. Uh, you, you avoid the ribs. Some people like the ribs. You know, it's just personal preference, but there, this boat is fast, okay? There, it, it, for a canoe, it's, it's quick. There's no joints on it, and we're canoe snobs at our house. We call the metal ones green bean cans and the plastic or Tupperware canoes, and we are snobs. Uh, <laughs> but it's very quick. It's as strong as an aluminum canoe. It doesn't flex like an aluminum canoe. This does not see white water. This is a lake. This is a, a you know, this is a lake canoe. And uh, the, the, but just getting it out, being able to paddle around in it, have other people come up and say, hey, I like your canoe, the, it's, it's satisfying. It is heavy. It's, you know, it's got some weight on it. Uh, and that's what the epoxy does, but it also gives you a lot of strength. So, hadn't had any issues with it. Uh, I protected the ends with a brass uh, stem piece. And I had the option of whether I wanted to put a keel all the way on the bottom and I chose not to based on where I felt like I was going to be using it. I wasn't as worried about hitting rocks and that type of thing. And it tracks very straight. So I have the, the stem piece that goes down and stops here on the front and back just to provide some protection when you come up on the sand or that type of thing. Yes, sir? How many people? This How is, wait? well, you know, for many years when my kids were young, it was my wife and I and two kids sitting in the middle. Uh, it would probably handle, I've had myself and one of my friends who's uh, eaten much more than I have, uh, who was tipped the scale at about 270 in it, and I mean, you could probably put six, 700 pounds or more. It's not, again, on the, this is, is designed from the original back in the 1800s to two people, picnic basket, you know, that type of thing, but, but it doesn't go much, it doesn't draw much water. Yes, sir? <laughs> Back to the, the front part there. Yeah. When you're doing the strips, you go the strips straight to each other like that. Yes. And then add that keel part on the front. Uh, well, what I did, let's go, well, can we go back a couple of pictures? Because you'll be able to, one of the ones on this. Keep going. One more. Let's go one more. Okay. Uh, in this picture on the, t on the left, you see where the black clamp is at? And then yeah. I've got the stem on there. So which, that's the first piece that you put on. The strips need a terminus. And that was the strips in, butt into the stem piece. Yes, sir. Is your uh, cross section of your stem big enough that you're, you don't have to point the strips? You got a, a bit of the stem showing on the interior? Uh, I do have a bit of the stem on the interior, yes, sir. Yeah, and, probably and makes it a lot easier to glass. It makes it a lot easier to glass, uh, and you know, really, the money is is the outside. But, but I did glass around the inside stem piece, and that that took a little more. We're talking about one piece. That took a lot more fitting on that. 
Did you glass it with a deck saw? Uh, on the I, interior. On doing the interior? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I did not. Yeah. I did the decks after. So. The forms itself, you had holes in them. You said there was a reason why the. Yeah, holes what I did on that, and you can see it there, is there's points where, <laughs> as the the, where I would use the holes to get the clamp in to clamp the strip to, to the frame. So uh, remember that the two forces you want are you want the strips against the frame, and you want them butted together to the next strip, and that's why I drilled the holes in the in the form so I could put a clamp in there. To clamp it directly to the frame. What's the clamp look like? You trying to figure out what picture? Well, I just. I know, but I mean, what kind of shape do you use? Well, I I used I just cut like a U shaped out of some old scrap plywood I had, just to help hold those. You uh, pull it out with hand pressure and. and no, I. C clipped it. Well, I used a lot of the C clamps, but what I would do is I use those homemade wood pieces. Uh, but to be honestly, you see the tape on there. I found that I could get the pressure I needed on these strips through uh, taping them down. Uh, now, sometimes I did use my homemade clamps, my U-shaped clamps, to to get the strips pushed down and together. But a lot of times, uh, like in that picture, I'm using the clamps to hold the the pieces together towards the frame. And I just use masking tape to hold the strips down. Well, here's the question is, why, why all the holes in the... Well, because when I got to the top, well, I cut them ahead of time. I didn't need them all on the, the bottom. But when I got to the top, then I would actually use those holes to put the clamp in and, and then clamp the strips down. So I, I, it was overkill a little, but I did was able to use it when I got actually got to the bottom part. Yes, sir. Now, theoretically, when you get finished with it, now that form, you could have built another one yeah. on top of it. Yeah, yeah. I, as the form was done, I could have, I could have taken it off and built another one right like that. And I kept the form for about ten years, thinking I ought to build another one. And then I ended up building four other types. So I, I, I think I may have them somewhere. I don't know. But, <laughs> but it, what was interesting is that was before. I mean, you can see in the background that that encompassed my shop. I built it in the garage. And people would drive by and slow down and look and try to figure out what I was doing because you build it upside down. Finally, somebody came by and said, you're building a boat. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> you know, it probably took me, it took me like four or five months. And, but that wasn't steady work. You know, I mean, I had, at that point, my kids were, you know, two and four. So, and you know, there was a lot of time spent with it. So I'd work, I'd put a strip or two on in the evening. I'd work some on the weekends. I wasn't in a hurry. But if I were to build one today, now that my kids are teenagers and they, they don't seem to want to have anything to do with me, I, you could probably build one in, you know, a month or so. When I did mine, I was running out of warm weather. We got in October, that fiberglass. Well, that's correct. And what I did is, I, I thought about that, and I kind of planned ahead. I said, okay, I got to put the fire glass in. And as we started getting towards cooler weather, I accelerated my. But it ended up, and one of the things that, that, that I did is I shut the garage door, moved the cars out, brought some lamps in, and uh, it was hot. I mean, but it helped the fiberglass cure. Uh, but all in all, for not having any woodworking experience, I was very uh, pleased with the way it came out. It was, a, again, more than anything, as a confidence builder allowed me to, to tackle some larger projects. My strongback that I built, I shimmed it, and, you know, I, I mean, I had it, but it, I knew that that was going to be it. That was the money shot. You better have that thing, and, you know, uh, the center line, the eyeball, the whole thing. Gotcha, At some point, if it looks good, it probably is going to be good. I mean, you know, it, could I got it within another, you know, sixteenth of an inch or, you know, 32nd or whatever, yeah, maybe, but you know, it's it's a piece of wood. You know. Strong backs of plywood box thing. Yeah, it's just I think I use uh, uh, plywood and a two by four. Yes, sir. Where did you get the uh, uh, paper frames that you used to cut those out with? Uh, the there's a company called Bear Mountain Boats, and one of the things I'm going to do is, and I apologize for this, I'm going to email uh, Bob, I'll email you or Rob or whoever with the different. 
Bear Mountain Boats is the company that's behind this book and they have, uh, I bought the plans from them. Now, just like uh, some of the other boats we're going to talk about, you can buy a kit that's got the strips in it, you know, that type of thing, but it was just a rolled up plans with each one of the station molds in life size. And I just cut them out and trace them. So, all right, any other questions before we talk about, yes, sir? North Cross is still in business. Is it? Did it come back? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good, good, they're good people. Okay. Oh, man, I love those guys. Yeah. Is that what it was? Well, the, after I built the cedar strip, I switched to skin on frame, so I didn't have a chance to go back, but I did cry the day it burnt down because the stuff they had in that warehouse, you know, 20 foot long, clear cedar boards. Still, they, they rebuilt. Okay. I, I appreciate you telling me that. I may have to go back and see it again. All right, so.